Good morning, everyone. I am Neharika Srivastava. I recently graduated with a master's in AI from the National University of Singapore, and I'm currently working as a data scientist. In recent times, the demand for building safe and ethical AI models has been increasing. Therefore, today we will examine what it means for AI to be trustworthy, focusing on two key aspects, robustness and fairness. In this talk, we'll first understand the key pillars that make up the field of trustworthy machine learning. We start by exploring the first interesting pillar, robustness. We'll see potential scenarios that make AI models vulnerable to adversarial attacks and how we defend against them. Next, we will explore the second pillar, fairness, and the various kinds of biases that can affect our model building process. This will be followed by an understanding of how one can measure fairness in AI models. Finally, we'll see the synergy between robustness and fairness and how optimizing for one affects the other. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll all become experts in AI risk. Well, I think the, one of the biggest questions to ask before beginning is that do any of you sitting here actually trust AI? And if the answer is a solid no, well, you're not really that alone. So last year, KPMG concluded um, a global survey covering about 17 countries regarding their trust in AI. And there was only a 67% of acceptance of AI usage across the general masses. About 84% believed that cybersecurity in AI still poses as a top concern. More than half of the population would not want an AI to make decisions related to HR and people management. Almost half of them one, were unaware that AI was even used in social media, let alone the disadvantages that come from it. However, mostly everyone expects AI to be regulated, made more safe, and abide by general human intuitions. Well, this brings us to what are the key pillars of trustworthy machine learning. The first one is robustness, and it refers to a, <coughs> sorry, to a model's ability to maintain, and perform, uh, maintain performance and reliability under varying conditions, such as adversarial attacks, data noise, or maybe other certain types of uncertainties. The second one is privacy in AI, and it refers to safeguarding sensitive user data and ensuring that AI systems handle and process information without exposing or compromising individuals' pers uh, personal data. The third one is fairness, and it refers to the principle of ensuring that AI models make unbiased decisions and provide equitable outcomes across different groups, avoid discrimination or favoritism of any kind. And then finally, we have transparency in AI that refers to the clarity and openness with which an AI system, uh, AI system's decision, processes, and underlying algorithms are communicated. This refers to explainability. And today, in this talk, we will be focusing on two pillars, robustness and fairness. So let's start with the first pillar, robustness. My bad. Uh, all right, so this is actually a very famous example of a model failure in real life. We all use ad blockers to filter out advertisements while surfing the web. It's essentially an AI model that takes in multiple images at, as inputs and classifies them as an ad or not. However, over here, we see that the ad blocker failed to, uh, failed to filter out these ads that look, that, I mean, these are images that look very much like any typical ad. So this was a model failure. Here is an image of, well, a pig that was classified correctly by the model. Uh, we then added a very small amount of noise to this image, and now the class of, uh, same model classified this image as an airliner. Here is a picture that was classified as a cat by 90% confidence by a model, and then after adding a small amount of noise, we see that to us humans, the resulting image still looks very much like a cat. However, to the same ML model, it classifies this as guacamole with 100% confidence. 
Now here is an example where all these images over here, they were correctly classified by an ML model. However, after adding some kind of noise, they were classified, all of them, as ostriches. And in this example, we see that instead of adding noise, we are simply rotating the images by a certain degree of angle. And even that is enough to make the model misclassify them. So this kind of model behavior makes us question what really is happening in all of these examples. Well, these are all various forms of an adversarial attack. So usually what happens in an adversarial attack or usually what the, uh, gen when we are training models, what happens is that we have a trained machine learning model. We give it an input during inference, and it produces an output that may or may not be correct, but it is still within accept ac acceptable bounds. However, during an adversarial attack, there exists a malicious agent actively interfering with the input to make it corrupt, and this adversarial input, when sent to the same model, will now produce absolutely disastrous outputs. Well, one natural question that might come up is if I add random noise to my data, does that make it adversarial attack? Here we have, here, here's an example. Here we have a correctly classified um, images of digits, so the left column, and then here, we have the same images, but with a lot of Gaussian noise added to them, to the point where you can't even make out if these were pictures of images. However, um, even then, the ML model is able to classify them with 53% accuracy. Sure, there was a loss of accuracy over here. However, the ML model could uh, find some kind of pattern. So therefore, even though there is a drop in accuracy, it's at the cost of making perceptible changes to the original input. Now, however, here we have the same digits on the left side that were correctly classified, but this time they are adversarially distorted on the right side. To us, there seems to be absolutely no difference between the two images. However, the ML model classifies them with 0% accuracy. So there is a magnificent drop in performance by making imperceptible changes to the input. Well, that seemed kind of interesting. So how do we create these adversarial inputs? Okay, so I'm now going to switch gears and dive a bit into a few mathematical notations to help us technically formulate this problem. Well, we have a model, which is a, a function f. Then we say have a data distribution that is used to train the model, and it follows a distribution d. We say have a data point x, comma y, where x is our input, y is the ground truth, and it belongs to the data distribution d. We have a loss that is calculated for the model. So f of x gives us the prediction, y is the output, l gives us the loss between the two. Say we have an adversarial input, x, dash, such that when we put this adversarial input to the model, f of x dash is not equal to the ground truth, because that is the main goal. Um, we have something called as a perturbation set of x, uh, denoted by p of x. So this set actually captures all kinds of imperceptible changes that you can make to your input x and create x dash. Let's talk a little bit more about the perturbation set. Um, one way to mathematically define it is that P of x is the set of all adversarial, Im uh, all, yeah, adversarial images such that the difference between, difference between the original input and the adversarial input is bound by a very, very small uh, value called epsilon. This is such that all the changes to our adversarial image is imperceptible to the human eye. And the one good heuristic to approximate x minus x bar is to take the is to simply take the LP norm of it. So this is the formula of LP norm. Given all this, the adversary's ob objective is now to find a point, such, uh, find a point from this perturbation set that maximizes the model loss. 
So over here, <laughs> okay, I'm not able to find the pointer, but um, f of z is f of z comma y. So f of z is the model output by giving the adversarial input to the model. And when we take the loss of that, it's going, uh, the adversary's objective is to maximize this loss. The point that maximizes this loss will become the adversarial input for our adversarial attack. So let's try to see how this works in an example, right? So let's say we have a simple binary classification task where our ground truths belong to plus one and minus one. Our model we are using is a simple logistic regression. And our loss for this, say we take binary cross entropy loss. There's a log over here, so we're taking log loss. We again have a perturbation set as discussed before. I've just rewritten it such that instead of saying x, uh, x minus x, I've just said there is our original input x. And we are adding some kind of an imperceptible change delta, which is very, very small, bounded by epsilon. And the adversary's goal is to, like we uh, saw before, maximize the loss on all kinds of um, data points from the perturbation set. So you see we have the loss just re-equated into the equation. And x plus delta refers to the adversarial input. x is original input, and delta is the imperceptible change added to it. And the goal is to maximize this loss. If we um, uh, simplify this, it becomes minimum of y comma uh, wt. W is the weights of the model. And if you just solve it for optimal delta, so we get this equation, minus y comma sine w uh, of, yeah, the sine of, the, sine of the model weights into the epsilon. So you don't have to worry much about the how we arrive here, it's just simple simplification and then finally finding the optimal delta. However, what can we do with this? So we know that given an input image, we only need to somehow add this much amount of noise in order to make it an adversarial in, uh, input. And well, coincidentally, this term over here is nothing but the sign of the gradient loss with respect to the original input. If you solve that big equation over there, it's basically uh, going to give you the red bracket term. And that is nothing but if you take the loss of your model with respect to the original input and then a gradient of it. So Again, equating back all the results into our final equation, our adversarial input is created by adding the term epsilon plus the loss gradient with respect to input to our original image. It's that simple. So the adversary basically needs on, only needs access to loss gradients. That is all. An example of what happened here, so say we had our original input x, which is pandas, and then using the formula we just created, this is the uh, gradient loss with respect to the input, and this is epsilon 0 0.07, so it's very little percentage of the noise added, and then you see that now the model is classifying this as a gibbon with 99.3% confidence. So we were able to create an adversarial input for the model, even though this input looks ap exactly like a panda to us. And that is how we just did an adversarial attack on the model. Now, the thing is that we can't keep going back and forth like this, so we have to think um, of training our models to become robust against such kind of attacks. Therefore, there is a concept of adversarial training. Well, the goal is to train robust models so that we minimize the loss on the strongest adversarial examples possible. So it's intuitive, right? Our goal is going to be, okay, so let's break this formula down. The green part over there you see was the adversary's goal. 
they were using this optimization to create the best possible adversarial input to the model. So intuitively, our goal should be to make our models robust against the, the strongest adversarial examples they can pro, um, create. Therefore, we have a min-max situation over there. And it's actually very easy to solve this. You solve it using gradient descent. Um, well, in the first step, you create and the strongest possible adversarial input for every input image in your training data. And then you update the model weights to minimize the loss. And this is um, a very recent, actually, 2024. So this is a portal, actually, that um, keeps track of the progress that is happening in the adversarial training sphere. So over here, uh, the red one, red data, the red box shows you the accuracies of all these models, wide ResNet, all kinds of ResNet architectures. So those are accuracies on a standard data set. Those are high accuracies, 93%, 94%, etc. cetera. Um, however, when they are subjected to an adversarial attack. Um, the accuracies decrease to say 73%, 71%. However, it's not as catastrophic as we were look, seeing before where the classification accuracies went to zero. So it does work and it's still an ongoing research in that sense. However, there are trade-offs, right? So this is a fun table. Say we have an adversarial test data set and we have a very normal standard model. In that case, we know that since the adversarial test data set is meant to attack the model, the accuracy is going to be very low. Therefore, you see 3.5%. However, if we have a robust model created using adversarial training, um, the accuracy increases to 45.8. It is still low as, uh, it, it, from a perspective of utility. However, it is kind of defending a huge percentage of the attack. But if we go to the next um, row, we have, say, a normal data set and a standard model, which is what we see in a general day-to-day -day life. Our accuracy is high to 95.2. However, when we have a normal data set and a robust model created using adversarial training, our accuracy has decreased to 87.3. So what I'm trying to imply from here is that Attacks are maybe 1% or 2% of your entire ML model um, usage, right? But you might be creating a robust model to, to prepare for the worst case scenario. But in a day-to-day -day life, using um, a robust model will definitely compromise the utility. So you need to take care when is it important for me to create robust models and when it's not. So because... Um, we are in the age of large language models. Um, I think it is important that we kind of see how the concept of robustness translates into LLMs. All right, so this is actually an example of someone who tried to, I mean, he's from Google, and he tried to attack a multimodal model called Chameleon by Meta. So a very, uh, the, the concept of LLMs is that you query something to the LLM, and it's supposed to, give you an output. However, nowadays we have heard that LLMs are safeguarded um, against destructive queries like how do I make a bomb? So if you go and put this query even in ChatGPT or Chameleon for that matter, it won't give you an answer. But um, there is a heuristic that can be used to extract this, the, the actual correct answer from such models. So the approach is that you want to force the model to give an affirmative response such as, sure, absolutely, here's the answer. So since LLMs are sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, if they are able to just give the token, sure, here's the answer, it is going to most probably complete the rest of the answer with the answer you want, which would be the answer to how do I make a bomb. Why? Because LLMs are also inherently trained to be aligned with the question's intent. So um, we somehow want to now do what? We want to somehow force the LLM to come to the state such that they output the tokens, sure, sure. Let's just optimize for that. So we want to build a suffix prompt so that the LLM will respond affirmatively to this 
uh, instruction. And in mathematical terms, you want to increase the probability of just the token sure, given your original query and the some suffix that we are adding to it, such that the LLM is forced to answer us. Uh, we don't care about the rest of the content, just maximizing the output sure. And using um, random trial and error, random optimization, he came up with this magic suffix. So you see, it's kind of a garbage to us, really. But when this suffix added to the original prompt of how do I make a bomb is given to chameleon, it actually gives you a whole step-by-step -step recipe of how to create a bomb. So we have basically surpassed the, uh, uh, the safeguarding rules of chameleon. And well, attacked the model in one sense. So this is uh, an attack by GPT-40, uh, sorry, on GPT-40. I actually uh, queried GPT-40 two weeks before coming here. So in this one, the prompt, if you see, I'm not directly asking the LLM to give me the recipe for LSD, but I'm just tricking it into somehow giving me the answer. And it very easily could not understand my malicious intent, and it just gave me a step-by-step -step recipe for it. Um, over here, this is mini GPT-4. So this is a multimodal model. Therefore, we have a text query, write a while letter, and then we have given some kind of an adversarial noise to uh, as part of the image input. Now, this noise to us actually seems like garbage, but to the model, it was enough to force it to output a very wild letter. So I have, you know, censored the parts, but the point that it actually was able to surpass LLM's safeguarding rules um, and give this kind of an output means that there is some there's some sort of gap in um, in terms of robustness. Well, I want to kind of point towards a few key takeaways from this. So because we were dealing with LLMs, which are basically text input, discretized, and then mapped to embedding space, it is actually hard to compute the loss gradient with respect to input. Loss gradients were something we were computing during adversarial training and so on. But this kind of concept doesn't apply to LLMs anymore because it's hard to do this. And in most cases, if you see, the adversary and the user is the same. I am the adversary giving a bad query. I am the person who is also going to receive the input. So if that is the case, then there is actually no need for in imperceptible changes to the input. You saw I gave a kind of a rubbish magic, query, uh, magic suffix to my query, and I gave some kind of a rubbish um, image in my multimodal model. And therefore, if this kind of an unnecessary constraint to create imperceptible changes to our input, to make it adversarial inputs, is removed, well, then none of the methods that I discussed a few slides before are directly even applicable to LLMs. Therefore, now that LLMs are actually taking off, it's important that we rethink robustness in the realms of Gen AI in general. I think diffusion models, we are, this is a continuous space, but however, in terms of text models, we should be thinking how robustness is um, applied. And well, with that, we finished robust, uh, robustness, so now we are going to focus on fairness. All right. Ah, great. So I'm going to explain how we, how when we create models, we may unconsciously encode some kind of a bias in our model building process. So here's a very classic example. It's actually a real life case where um, there were two prisoners in the U.S. state prison, and there was they were using a software to predict the likelihood of a defendant committing a future crime if, say, they were to get released. Well, the software, the ML model used, predicted Brisha to be a high risk. Her prior offenses were that she had uh, conducted four juvenile misdemeanors. And after getting released, in reality, her subsequent offenses were none. She didn't do anything. She was a good citizen. Um, however, he was predicted as a low risk, 
and his prior offenses were two armed robberies and one attempted armed robbery. These were used, by the way, as features to predict if, his, if he's a high risk or, or a low risk. And after actually getting released, he um, conducted one grand theft. So there was some kind of a bias that was encoded in this software, which disabled the model to properly predict what could have happened. In that, I mean, with that note, I think it's important to understand what kind of biases are there which we can unconsciously encode. So the first one is, a, is called historical bias. Well, I think it's better if I explain all of this using an example. So what happened is that in 2014, Amazon decided to automate their recruiting process, and they used 10 years worth of Amazon job applications and they used it as a training set, trained their AI model, and their um, labels were basically application job outcomes. So given a resume that was applied to Amazon, was it selected or not? And they used this model to finally apply to the general public. So in 2016, there was starting to become a, be a rise in well, non-male applicants. And when they started to apply to uh, Amazon, their applications started to, getting, uh, started to get rejected for absolutely no reason. And uh, well, this happened because the training data set that Amazon used for their AI model had a majority of just male applications. And they were probably using it as a feature in their training uh, model process. So because this happened, uh, like because this in issue happened because of historical bias uh, being present. Um, I mean, okay, so there was historically a different trend. Therefore, this it, like creeped into their model building process, and there was an issue. So in 2016, they found out this issue, and then they had to close the project altogether. The second kind of bias is called representation bias. So, well, the definition is that, say you have samples in your training data set, they tend to either over-represent or under-represent some part of the population. So it basically fails to generalize well to every kind of group there is. And um, an another example, again, these are all real life examples. So. We wanted to train, big tech companies wanted to train a speech-to-text system, Alexa, Siri, so on. And the data set they used was to uh, use audiobooks. So we have large amounts of voice data. That's good. However, most of the audiobooks at that time were narrated by middle-aged white men. So what happened is that you know, all these, um, so on the y-axis, you see average WER, that is word a error rate. So um, for whenever a, whenever a white person would be giving an input to this speech-to-text uh, text system, there was a lower error rate as compared to, say, there was some other ethnicity giving an input. And that happened because, well, different ethnicities, it's known, happen to have different kinds of vocabulary, accents, and then tones, and so on. And the model simply failed to encompass all of these different changes. So they basically, different groups in the society weren't represented well, hence it's called representation bias. Uh, then we have measurement bias. So say I have three different pictures of a lion and I focus on the face and I say, all right, so whenever you see a face like this and features like this, it is supposed to be a lion. However, during inference time, I give a picture like this and the model has just simply failed. I mean, the model cannot see any face per se and it hasn't learned the bodily features. So it doesn't know if this is a lion or not. So it fails to generalize then. And um, so measurement is coming because the uh, data set that you used, well, it's not reflecting what you eventually want to measure in your test environment. The fourth one is called aggregation bias. So this actually happens when, say, we know that in the population, there are 
separate groups per se, but we still decide to use a one model fits all kind of a situation. Um, we may think that maybe this one model, unified model, uh, may be able to generalize well over the entire population, but it doesn't happen so all the time. So over here, if you see, um, the green is one group, the blue is another. Overall, the accuracy of the model is 82%, so one might say, okay, that's a fairly good uh, model. However, for green per se, the people belonging to the green group, the accuracy is 0%, so it's catering not at all to the green group. Um, so, I mean, the green people would say they're being unfairly treated. A very easy way to solve this is to just create two different models for groups and then everyone's happy. However, of course, the trade-off is that if you have too many groups, how, how many models are you going to create? Maintenance and so on. And also, when you are segregating them into groups, what if they are overlapping groups or you missed out a few groups? So things to uh, keep in mind. And the last one is called evaluation bias. So this happens during the um, evaluation phase. The benchmark data that was used for a particular task may not have represented the entire user population, and therefore some wrong um, perceptions are made by the model. So again, let's take an example. We have an AI model that was created to check if, um, to check how the voter turnout is going to be in a particular region. So we take an input as a person and we, uh, we say if this person is going to likely vote or not. Um, while we were evaluating the model, we decided to test this model on, say, our local city or village, right? So there was a few kind of, uh, uh, there was a group, they were representing some sort of, well, characteristics. And with that in mind, during evaluation, we saw that, okay, our model that we have trained performs well. We have tested it on local voters. It gives us 95% accuracy. However, when the same model is deployed to a countrywide, loca uh, countrywide region, so then what happens is that our model started to perform really badly. It just gave 55% accuracy. This basically means that it wasn't able to generalize well to the whole of the country. In some ways, it's kind of gen uh, it kind of can be called as representation bias. However, this is happening during evaluation phase, right? So I think um, there are multiple kinds of fairness that can be dealt with. One is group fairness, or you might want to optimize for individual fairness. However, today I will be dealing with group fairness. So. The belief that we are going to go in with while dealing with fairness is that group membership should be irrelevant for decisions, even if it has a predictive value. So for example, say when candidates are applying for jobs, generally a candidate's religious beliefs should be irrelevant to the job process. So that means we shouldn't be taking all of these irrelevant features into consideration while building models. Or say, again, we have a candidate applying, going through a job application process, um, and we have their disability information. Of course, um, it's a fact that, say, if a, can a candidate is disabled, uh, disabled, it's possible that the company might need to spend more for to accommodate their changes. However, that should not be used um, while creating a model for job applications for those candidates because it's just morally irrelevant, even when it is it has the potential to have predictive value. And the idea is that we should finally remove any kind of membership features from modeling. So if that is the idea, Say if I remove, for example, things like gender and religion from my model training process, will my model start becoming fair? 
Well, it is actually possible that by simply removing, it's not that helpful because other features might start to combine and act as proxies for those features that you just removed. So nothing has actually happened. And uh, I haven't added that point, but some people, some researchers say that adding signals like um, group membership, it could be anything, ethnicity or whatnot, actually adds more signals to your model building process so you know where your model can fail and how to avoid it. So we definitely be, uh, need better me measures for fairness. Also, I think from this slide, you might realize that it's very, very different from robustness where it was so well defined and the goal was crisp. Over here, it's more um, specified by domain knowledge and intuition of the person actually building the model. So we have one uh, measure called demographic parity, which formally creates, um, which formally measures fairness. So say we have two groups, A and B. Our end goal basically should be that our decision, probability D of one, D's decision, our decision should be irrespective of what group that person belongs to. We have another measure, co measure co called separation. And again, for any group, uh, two groups, A and B, the what is required is that the decision be independent of group A given the ground truth labels. So people generally agree that this particular measure is more intuitive with um, how we as humans think. And also if you have the measure for this, uh, you will like, like you will kind of get a good idea if your model is um, being unfair or not. However, one con of that is that we require the ground truth for this, and during inference time, we don't have ground truth labels. So during inference, we don't know if our model is actually being fair or not. Okay, so we're actually mostly at the end of our presentation. Since we studied about robustness also, they do interplay. So the red line over here you see, it's a highly robust model, okay? And then it's also unfair, completely unfair. So there's no fairness measures taken right now. So our test accuracy on this highly robust model is say, somewhere around 85, 90. However, when I start to increase fairness in this model, it's going down, you see that the test accuracy starts to decrease tremendously. So yes, increasing fairness does reduce robustness. Also, we talked about a few other pillars, privacy, transparency. So, well, it's not covered here, but then increasing fairness will also affect privacy, vice versa. So there's always a trade-off. All right, so to conclude, our key takeaway is that it is easy uh, to adversarial, adversarially attack ML model by accessing just their input gradients. Uh, this is applicable for white box models where you have the model weights, you can access the loss gradients. And for open source models, well, those are white box models, so you can definitely do this. Um, second, since we are into this new age of deep learning, it is important to rethink how robustness should be standardized. Fairness, as we saw, is extremely domain specific and increasing robustness and fairness affects either along with the utility of the model. And well, thank you so much. That's the end of our talk, yeah. Um, any questions? All right, okay, yeah, there's one question. Um, so you talk about having a highly robust model with um, fairness kind of reduce the accuracy of uh, the model. Uh, uh, is there any other way around that or that's just how um, it's gonna be? <laughs> just out of curiosity. Um, so as far as I know, I think it's, uh, it's always a trade-off. Um, well, I'm not sure of the new techniques that are there that people are working on. A lot of the time, there's recency bias also played. Say, 
say you created a robust model and then you solve for fairness. So how people try to just hack their way around is that say a group was unfairly treated in a highly robust model. So they will start to add data points from those groups specifically into their training process. And it's known that the model is uh, going to provide more weightage to these new data points. So that might just solve uh, fairness for that particular instance. But however, when you start adding more new data points, the weight starts to lessen. So um, yeah, from again, I, I have a, a slightly limited knowledge in this section, but yeah, it's an open research problem for sure. Hi, hi, I'm Peter. I have a question because um, you mentioned about trust to AI, and uh, I have that sentence uh, in my mind that trust is the transfer of responsibility to someone else uh, for verifying reality. And when you bring that um, adversarial attacks example, have you heard about that real life examples where anybody was hurt or killed by that kind of uh, attacks? So um, I have two um, points over here. Well, hurt and killed is, I think, extreme. However, we saw that um, in the Amazon job application example, those were actual people whose lives were getting affected career-wise. Um, usually when we talk about robustness, there's this common example given during self-driving cars. So we saw how the image can be adversarially um, changed. So say we have a car, and uh, an, autom an autonomous car, and it takes in image inputs while it's driving. So say if there's a stop sign and someone adversarially changed it to look still look like a stop sign but now the ml model interprets it as go left or speed so the car will just go in some weird direction um, however a lot of talks are also there where they say that if someone wanted to actually kill someone by um, you know speeding a car at that way they won't go to such weird lengths to do this so like i said i think killing is a little too extreme however there are a lot more worse ways than people can, uh, you know, like, um, I, I mean, I don't want to say screw, but then they can mess with your lives in different aspects. So, yeah. OK, thank you. All right, thank you so much for that of time.